Cambridge English, first three, tests one to four. Published by Cambridge University Press and Uckles, 2018. This recording is copyright. CD2. This is the Cambridge English first listening test, test three. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. You'll hear each piece twice. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. You'll have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There will now be a pause. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, Choose the best answer, A, B, or C. Question 1. You hear a young woman, who is an apprentice cook, talking about her apprenticeship. I did well at school, but wasn't sure what to do next, to carry on studying or get a job straight away. Then I discovered the apprenticeship scheme, and now I'm in college for part of the week, studying professional cookery, and an apprentice working in local restaurants, including a four-star one, for the rest of it. The restaurant work is exhausting, and because I'm never in the same kitchen two days running, it's hard to settle into a routine. But the experience is invaluable, and it's paving the way to realising my dream of opening my own restaurant, and I've learned so many different cooking techniques from my teacher at college. I did well at school, but wasn't sure what to do next, to carry on studying or get a job straight away. Then I discovered the apprenticeship scheme, and now I'm in college for part of the week, studying professional cookery, and an apprentice working in local restaurants, including a four-star one, for the rest of it. The restaurant work is exhausting, and because I'm never in the same kitchen two days running, it's hard to settle into a routine. But the experience is invaluable, and it's paving the way to realising my dream of opening my own restaurant. And I've learned so many different cooking techniques from my teacher at college. Question 2. You hear two students talking about passing the time on bus journeys. I seem to spend my life taking crowded buses all over town. It gets tedious and there's never a chance to sit down and do a quick bit of work. What about music? Haven't you got any earphones? Yeah, but I suspect if I did that, I'd completely lose track of time. Might miss my stop. Oh, right. Or the other thing for me is just looking out of the window at what's going on. You know, unwinding, even solving problems. I'll watch the world go by if I'm sitting in a window seat. But usually I'm jammed up against a metal pole, concentrating on not losing my bag. I seem to spend my life taking crowded buses all over town. It gets tedious and there's never a chance to sit down and do a quick bit of work. What about music? Haven't you got any earphones? Yeah, but I suspect if I did that, I'd completely lose track of time. Might miss my stop. Oh, right. Or the other thing for me is just looking out of the window at what's going on. You know, unwinding, even solving problems. I'll watch the world go by if I'm sitting in a window seat, but usually I'm jammed up against a metal pole, concentrating on not losing my bag. Question 3. You hear a cycle coach telling his group about the ride they are going to do.
Right, listen really carefully, everyone. We're going to do the Moorland Hill route. Tony will lead us out of the car park. Please stay in a tight, compact group with no overtaking until we get out of town and over the bridge. Then we get onto the A69 main road. We'll be turning off at the second exit, not the first. Please note, because they're both signposted to Moorland Hill. I want you to try and push it up the big hill today, so save your legs and conserve some speed on the long, flat stretch past Aiken Village. On the return route, we'll have the wind behind us, so you can get some speed up later. Right, listen really carefully, everyone. We're going to do the Moorland Hill route. Tony will lead us out of the car park. Please stay in a tight, compact group with no overtaking until we get out of town and over the bridge. Then we get onto the A69 main road. We'll be turning off at the second exit, not the first. Please note, because they're both signposted to Moorland Hill. I want you to try and push it up the big hill today, so save your legs and conserve some speed on the long, flat stretch past Aiken Village. On the return route, we'll have the wind behind us, so you can get some speed up later. Question 4. You hear part of an interview in which a writer talks about autobiographies. Have you ever considered writing an autobiography? Well, certain sections of my novels are based on my experiences growing up. But as a reader, I've found autobiographies deeply unsatisfying and have no real enthusiasm for doing one. Some consist of chapter after chapter of mind-numbing trivial detail, or endless pages where the writer praises him or herself with little justification. Recently, in the autobiography of someone I've known personally since childhood, pure invention and no mention at all of several people who contributed significantly to his success. Have you ever considered writing an autobiography? Well, certain sections of my novels are based on my experiences growing up, but as a reader I've found autobiographies deeply unsatisfying and have no real enthusiasm for doing one. Some consist of chapter after chapter of mind-numbing trivial detail, or endless pages where the writer praises him or herself with little justification. Recently, in the autobiography of someone I've known personally since childhood, pure invention, and no mention at all of several people who contributed significantly to his success. Question 5. You hear a journalist telling a colleague about her time at university. You're a biology graduate. What prompted you to take up journalism? You'd be amazed at how wide and varied it is, and how much it overlaps with other subjects like ecology, psychology, chemistry. And you could see this from the sort of jobs biology graduates were going into. I read all this on the university website. Some were even getting into jobs like banking. As for me, I got asked to report on one of my projects for the University Student Science magazine. Then that took off into a regular column, and so that sowed the seeds of a career. You're a biology graduate. What prompted you to take up journalism? You'd be amazed at how wide and varied it is, and how much it overlaps with other subjects like ecology, psychology, chemistry. And you could see this from the sort of jobs biology graduates were going into. I read all this on the university website. Some were even getting into jobs like banking. As for me, I got asked to report on one of my projects for the University Student Science magazine. Then that took off into a regular column, and so that sowed the seeds of a career. Question 6. You hear a man and a woman talking about a new clothes shop they have visited. I went into that new clothes shop you were telling me about to have a look round. The one in Bridge Street? Yeah, you said you really liked the way they have a member of staff just inside the door to welcome you with a smile. That's right. Why didn't you like it? Well, I can't see the point of it. And shops soon lose interest in these experiments, which tells you something about the reaction of customers. Mind you, that's a step up on what happens in some clothes shops, where you get pushy sales staff asking if you need any help the moment you get near them. That I can't stand. 
I went into that new clothes shop you were telling me about to have a look round. The one in Bridge Street? Yeah, you said you really liked the way they have a member of staff just inside the door to welcome you with a smile. That's right. Why didn't you like it? Well, I can't see the point of it. And shops soon lose interest in these experiments, which tells you something about the reaction of customers. Mind you, that's a step up on what happens in some clothes shops, where you get pushy sales staff asking if you need any help the moment you get near them. That I can't stand. Question 7. You overhear a woman talking on the phone to a friend. Well, what's happening is I'm applying for lots of full-time posts. But meanwhile, I've been networking on social media with a group of recent graduates based in my town. We're planning to buy a portable climbing wall, like the things you get now in some sports centres. Then we can take it to different places where there are lots of children, like beaches, country parks, that sort of thing. Some of the guys are trained mountaineers, so the safety qualifications are already in place and I'd be the photographer taking action pictures of each climber to sell to the parents online. Shame it's only seasonal. Well, what's happening is I'm applying for lots of full-time posts, but meanwhile I've been networking on social media with a group of recent graduates based in my town. We're planning to buy a portable climbing wall, like the things you get now in some sports centres. Then we can take it to different places where there are lots of children, like beaches, country parks, that sort of thing. Some of the guys are trained mountaineers, so the safety qualifications are already in place. And I'd be the photographer taking action pictures of each climber to sell to the parents online. Shame it's only seasonal. Question 8. You hear part of a broadcast on the radio. A two-meter-tall penguin weighing in at 115 kilos. That's what researchers say the fossils of wing and foot bones recently unearthed in Antarctica belonged to. Such a bird would have been alive 37 million years ago. Given that the emperor penguin, the largest living species of penguin, stands 1.1 meters tall and weighs just under 50 kilos, it's no wonder that this newly discovered specimen is being called the Colossus. To find out more about this extraordinary bird, including how its giant size allowed it to stay underwater for up to 40 minutes to hunt for fish, tune in tonight after the weather forecast. A two-meter-tall penguin weighing in at 115 kilos. That's what researchers say the fossils of wing and foot bones recently unearthed in Antarctica belonged to. Such a bird would have been alive 37 million years ago. Given that the emperor penguin, the largest living species of penguin, stands 1.1 meters tall and weighs just under 50 kilos, it's no wonder that this newly discovered specimen is being called the Colossus. To find out more about this extraordinary bird, including how its giant size allowed it to stay underwater for up to 40 minutes to hunt for fish, tune in tonight after the weather forecast. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two.